God bless you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, tonight's session is in two parts. We will conclude the sixth and seventh trial of Jesus Christ. And then in the second part, I'm going to introduce the revised work on Eli, Eli, Lamna Sabathani. My God, my God, for this purpose I was spared. Worked it from the Greek. And so I want to share that with you. Uh, most approaches have been to work it from the Aramaic that's left in the Gospels. So to begin, let's take a look at uh, Pilate, his life, and the things that he had in his heart and lacked. Pilate had the complete legal authority to release Jesus right from the very start. But Pilate's fears destroyed him. Pilate's fears stopped him from being a great governor. Matthew 27, 18 says, For he, Pilate, knew that for envy they, the religious leaders, had delivered him, Jesus Christ. If Pilate knew about Jesus and about his conflict with the religious leaders in Jerusalem, he was well informed about the Savior. He may not have heard that Jesus was the King of the Jews or that as the Messiah, Jesus was the Son of God. But twice now, Jesus had entered Jerusalem. Jesus had entered in judgment. Jesus had entered in triumph. Pilate understood Jesus as a phenom of first century spiritual life. The last thing Pilate wanted to do was to go down in history as the Roman tribune who ordered the crucifixion of the popular and widely loved rabbi from Galilee. How could Pilate explain this on the Roman cocktail circuit? He looked like a monster for the rest of his life. Yet there he was at the crack of dawn, face to face with becoming this exact nightmare. On the other hand, Pilate's fear of the Pharisees had Pilate trapped. He was especially vulnerable because of the coming Passover. Jews from across the Roman world flooded Jerusalem with their enthusiasm, money, and in many cases, with their hatred for Rome. From Pilate's point of view, the place must have seemed like a tinderbox ready for riot and violence. The last thing Pilate wanted was for the entire religious hierarchy to start stirring up trouble during this time in which the whole world was watching him. In the last two sessions, by one count, we've covered five of the six trials of Jesus. The first before Annas, the second trial was the night trial before Caiaphas, and the third was the morning trial before Caiaphas. After the third trial, the Judeans turned Jesus over to Pilate for crucifixion. Pilate's first attempt to release Jesus occurred almost immediately. After Pilate interrogated Jesus for some time, John 18.38 gives this record. He, Pilate, went out again unto the Jews and says to them, I find in him no fault at all. Luke 23.4 gives more details about this first attempt. It says, Then said Pilate to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. Even this early in the morning, the people had begun to gather around the news of Jesus' arrest. Luke 23, 5 tells us why Pilate's attempt failed. And they, the religious leaders, were the more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people. That's Inesio, is the word for stirreth up, and it's Strong's 383. Uh, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. Stirring up the people means to greatly incite, to make unruly. This was a false accusation. Those who followed Jesus' teachings were filled with love for their neighbor and great peace and piety. The only other place we see this word, anesio, uh, to occur is when the Bible reveals that the Pharisees stirred up the lynch mob and that the Pharisees' uh, mob took over the praetorium and demanded Jesus' crucifixion. Whatever the reason, whether it was the coming Passover or else something else entirely, Pilate was truly afraid of these religious leaders. From the start, he could see we could see that Pilate was under their thumb when he submitted to them disgracefully by going out to them like a dog to his masters. Uh, he had to do so because the Pharisees told him the praetorian was unclean. It was me. I'd have just sent an email. Say, what do you want? But he went out to them. 
you know, wringing his hands. The chief priest's displeasure was all it took to keep Pilate from fulfilling his legal duty as governor. Instead, when Pilate heard Jesus was a Galilean, he sent Jesus to Herod for judgment because Galilee was part of Herod's jurisdiction. Pilate's meeting with Jesus was Jesus' fourth trial. Then uh, his meeting with Herod was his fifth. Attached to this session is a document showing all seven trials of Jesus. If you open it up, it will also help with illustrating other elements of this teaching. The trial with uh, Annas is a bit suspect because he was an, he announced no verdict. Herod's inquisition was also dubious because Herod, while he sends out a verdict, didn't take it very seriously. However, I really like the uh, idea of counting the trials because it allows us to group so much complex information into a manageable structure. Here's Luke 23, 12 that says, And the same day Pilate and Herod uh, became friends together, for they were at enmity between themselves. Herod seemed to have been very happy to have met Jesus, and perhaps Pilate was happy to have a second voice added to his own concerning the release of the Messiah. Nevertheless, when Herod went, was sent back to, G, to Pilate, this resulted in Pilate's second meeting with Jesus. This is also Jesus' sixth trial and Pilate's second attempt to release the Savior. The sixth trial is where we left off in the last session. Please turn to Luke chapter 23, verse 13. And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people, uh, please go ahead and scroll down to that picture of the Praetorium on the linked document. While both these inquiries into Jesus occurred in the Praetorium, this gathering in Luke 23, 13 is a different setting than when Pilate first met with Jesus. In his first meeting with Jesus, no Pharisees were present. Uh, Pilate went out to the high priests and elders and sent for Jesus to be brought before him. From this model of the Praetorium, you can see... Uh, that there are, are roofed sections. Those are the sections under which the religious leaders refuse to go. You can also get an idea of the large unroofed courtyard where Pilate's bema or judgment seat uh, would have been. In John 19, 13, within this large courtyard was a separate raised area called the pavement. And in Hebrew, it was Gabbatha. The Greek word uh, names this place in terms of how it was made. The Hebrew word names the place according to its form. If Herod the Great's palace did indeed become the Roman headquarters or praetorium, then it was over three football fields in length. The plaza square would have been large enough for a pretty good-sized lynch mob to assemble. Luke tells us that the high priests, the elders, and the people were all present at this second trial before Pilate. Therefore, they met on the square just before the pavement, um, just before the pavement upon which Pilate's judgment seat rested. Now Luke 23.14 marks the conclusion of Jesus Christ's second trial before uh, Pilate. Here it is. It's in Luke 23.14. Said Pilate unto them, Ye have brought this man to me as one that perverteth the people. And I, behold, having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man, touching those things whereof ye accuse him. Pilate made a great display of the second interrogation or examination of Jesus. For he tried Jesus before the high priests, the elders, and the people. He examined Jesus in front of the religious leaders and the, and the people to show the honesty and thoroughness and uprightness of his process. Pilate then says, I have tried him before you. All of You have to imagine the great courtyard filled with many, many people and Pilate speaking their great speaking voice. Way out into oratory land. I have tried him before all of you. All of this he does to add weight to the judgment of not guilty. In Luke 24, 15, Pilate also gives Herod, Herod's verdict. Here it is in Luke 24, 15. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent him to you. And lo, nothing worthy of death is done to him. Done by him, actually. Uh, Pilate was doing great. From Luke 23.12 to Luke 23.15, he commanded the Pharisees to show up, and they did. He declared boldly that neither he nor Herod found any fault in the miracle worker from Galilee. Great! Great! So Pilate let him go, right? Uh, no. Luke 23.16 says, I will therefore chastise him and release him. Only Luke gives this detail 
of the outcome of the trial uh, from the pavement. The second attempt to release Jesus should probably be called Pilate's second attempt to get permission of the chief priests to release uh, Jesus. The seeds of Pilate's fear and weakness have already been sown way back in Luke 23, 16. Pilate is already making a political compromise instead of doing his duty as a Roman magistrate. If Pilate found no fault in Jesus, then why chastise him? It's as if, it's as if Pilate is saying to the Sanhedrin, I'm not going to kill this man, but just to make you Pharisees happy, I'll whip him a little bit. I'll beat him some. He won't be bothering you again. Just trust me. Beating a man you know is without guilt is a desperate and losing strategy. Let's return to Matthew and Mark for more details about the opening of Jesus' sixth trial. Here is Matthew 27:11. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. This is the second time uh, Jesus answered Pilate's question about being king of the Jews. You know it is how the essence of that works. As we saw last week, the English translation, Thou sayest, sounds like Jesus is being evasive. But, as we saw by way of the scripture buildup with Mark uh, 14, 61-62, it's just the opposite. Mark shows that without the idiom, this unique affirmative answer uh, is uh, straight, simply, I am. Because that's what it says... That's what Mark says Jesus answered. However, when you put in the idiom, you get an especially bold and forceful assertion of the truth. Even in English, we use a similar idiom when we say, you said it. However, the force of this first century Hebrew idiom might be more like, you know it. I say this because the first use with Judas involved Judas asking Jesus if he was the one to betray Jesus. Judas already knew the answer. This second trial before Pilate was a spectacle. Pilate would have shouted his question to the crowd, and they would have yelled answers back. Because not only the Sanhedrin, but the people were now present, and because 1 Timothy 6.13 tells us Jesus' witnesses before Pilate was an example of power and authority in the face of persecution, it would not surprise me at all that Jesus would have in turn shouted out his answer, You know I am! To the entire crowd. Matthew 27 12 shows why this is indeed the second response to Pilate's question about being a king, and that this response occurred during the second trial of Jesus before Pilate. Here's Matthew 27 12. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. As Luke explained, Pilate was trying Jesus publicly. So the priests were permitted to shout vehement accusations against Jesus when they and Pilate expected Jesus to answer. The trial was completely out of order, of course. But again, during the first trial, only Jesus was present. This time, Pilate called them all together before his judgment seat. So when you hear the chief priests responding and Pilate there, that's the second trial. These events are also recorded in Mark 15, 2 through 5. Let's get a running start at Mark's record by beginning at Mark 15.1. And straightway in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes, and the whole council bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. Mark 15 begins with the conclusion of the morning trial before Caiaphas. Mark then skips all of Jesus' first trial before Pilate and his trial before Herod. Mark 15.2 begins the record of Jesus' second trial before Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered unto him, Thou sayest it. As in Matthew, Mark also records Jesus' second bold declaration of his identity to Pilate. As we'll see, God always backs up his word. Men and women may not choose to believe, but when we stand for God, God will turn the lights on. People will understand that they have a choice. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Mark 15, 3. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. We know Mark 15 is the second trial before uh, Pilate because it too records the chief priests hurling unproven allegations at Jesus. Because they threw the book at Jesus Christ in the night trial, it is certain that the Pharisees knew these were allegations they could not prove by way of witness evidence. 
Nevertheless, these high priests continued to slander Jesus with unproven charges. It was midnight in Jerusalem. Here's the rest of Mark 15, 4 through 5, that confirms the record in Matthew. And Pilate asked him again, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witness against thee. But Jesus answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. In Matthew 27, 13, as in Mark 14, 4, Pilate prods Jesus to get him to answer and perhaps give evidence against himself. Matthew 27, 13, then Pilate said to him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? Matthew twenty seven fourteen shows that Jesus ignored the urging. In fact, his silence and composure revealed his tremendous spiritual strength. He stood far and away above his accusers. Jesus did not dignify the enemy's uh, people with a response. Legally, he needed to provide no evidence against himself. The burden was on the uh, Pharisees to produce evidence and witnesses, which they did not, which is why you get Pilate's answer of not guilty. Matthew twenty seven fourteen, And he, Jesus, answered to him never a word, insomuch that the governor, Pilate, marveled greatly. The peace Jesus must have exuded in the face of these senseless false accusations was surely marvelous. This is the end of Jesus' sixth trial, his spectacle trial. Although the Bible is silent on the Pharisees' response to Pilate's first verdict, as given in Luke above, surely they went crazy. Nevertheless, in Luke 23.16, Pilate says, I will release him, with no mention of Barabbas or the custom of releasing a prisoner just before Passover. This is Pilate's second attempt to release Jesus. Surely, as Pilate's first attempt to release Jesus was overcome by the Pharisees' outcry, so this second attempt to release Jesus was overcome by their outcry again. The Pharisees didn't care that their baseless claims had been exposed publicly. They didn't care that Herod had joined uh, with Pilate in saying that they found no fault in Jesus. What was Pilate to do? Nothing had changed since that morning. Pilate was still trapped. On the one hand, Pilate was trapped by the need for civil peace during Passover. And on the other, he was trapped by his horror at being made the patsy for crucifying the beloved Jesus of Nazareth. What was he to do? Matthew 27, 15 through 18 gives the next event, the lead up to Jesus' trial before the people. Verse 15. Now at that feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Mark fifteen six explains the lead up to trial seven in this way. Now at that feast, he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. There was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them, that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. A multitude crying aloud began to desire him to do as he had ever done before. While Jesus stood before Pilate on the pavement, and while the religious leaders continued to angrily protest Pilate's verdict, the people began to call out, perhaps even to chant, Release a prisoner! Release a prisoner! The crowd has made no mention of either Barabbas or Jesus. In Mark 15, 9, it is Pilate, the wimp, who brings up this choice. But Pilate, in verse 9, it says, But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Pilate's question, Will ye that I release the king of the Jews, implies that the crowd indeed had heard Jesus Christ's declaration to Pilate that he was a king of the Jews. This again marks the start of Jesus' seventh trial, his trial before the people of Jerusalem. These same events are outlined in Matthew twenty seven, fifteen through seventeen. Matthew twenty seven fifteen. Now at the feast the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner, whomever they the people wanted. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, this is when all those people were gathered in the square by Gabbatha and Pilate's Bema. When they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Who will ye that I release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? This introduces the story of Barabbas. Matthew twenty-seven eighteen gives us a little bit of Pilate's reasoning. For he, Pilate, knew that for envy they, the chief priests, had delivered him. If the chief priests had delivered Jesus to Pilate for death because of their envy of Jesus Christ's popularity with the people, 
then surely the people would be on Pilate's side if he gave them a chance. But this is still a total farce. If Pilate found no cause of death in Jesus, as he said in Luke 23, 15, why would Jesus have been numbered among inmates of whom one was to be released? Legally, Pilate should have just released Jesus. Jesus' life should never, never been part of this release the killer charade. The chief priests have not trapped Pilate. He is trapped in his own fears. Nevertheless, offering the people a choice between Jesus and Barabbas is Pilate's third attempt to release Jesus. After Pilate offers the crowd the choice between Jesus and Barabbas, a not insignificant period of time passes. In this time, two important events occur. The first is presented in Matthew 27, 19, which reads, When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with this just man, for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. Surely any message from Pilate's wife at Pilate's judgment seat must have been alarming. It would be as if your spouse knowingly sent you a text while you're in the middle of teaching body, soul, and spirit to the multitudes. It would surprise you and, and alarm you. Pilate's wife receiving a dream from God for which the interpretation was plain is beyond miraculous. Giving a vision to the wife of a Gentile is beyond the promises in God's word. Once way back in Genesis 20, Abimelech received a vision that saved Abraham and the Christ line, but in those days there was yet some believing in the world, and the Mosaic law had not yet been given. Pilate's wife, receiving a dream and knowing what it meant, was huge. Twice Jesus had boldly declared that he was indeed a king of the Jews from a kingdom which was not of this world. God would not let his words fall to the ground. God backed up his words as spoken by his only begotten son. When we speak for him by written and the incarnate word, he still backs us up. Signs, miracles, and wonders still follow those who believe. There was also great love and mercy in God's work through Pilate's wife. The depths of God's love and mercy for mankind always amazes me. God is fighting for Pilate's life here. There was still time. Pilate could still have stood up, and rather than asking who the crowd chose, Pilate could have released both men. He could have taken Jesus' name completely out of the discussion. Why didn't he? He was afraid. Even though his fears were leading him to more and more desperate judgments, he was still sure he could wriggle off the hook without taking a stand. Had he stood up, glory. But in Pilate's mind, he was sure that the people would decide for Jesus. As a result, Rome would then be off the hook, and the Pharisees could say nothing. It seemed like the perfect plan, but godly results cannot arise from ungodly means. Both Matthew and Mark record that the Pharisees persuaded or moved the people so that they sought to have Barabbas released and destroy Jesus. This is the second important event that took place between the time Pilate presented the choice of the people. He's standing, uh, Jesus is standing, the Pharisees are yelling and screaming. Then he takes a seat on his bema and he gets and reads the note from his wife. So as he's reading and rereading and pondering the message from his wife, even at that moment, the Pharisees are working the people. Here's the record in 2720. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. There does not appear to be any bribery involved in Matthew's record or Mark's. However, Matthew uses the straightforward persuaded, which is derived from pistios, to believe. Here is Mark 1511. But the chief priests moved Anaseo, strong 383, the people, that there should rather release Barabbas unto them. The word moved is beyond to shake or to stir. The verb to shake is intensified by the exclamatory prefix ana, which means up. It means to really, really shake up. The details of the grammar are far more accessible via the document linked to the session, so if you scroll down, you can see it. The best example I can think of uh, to help us get a picture of this word is Shakespeare's old play, Julius Caesar. When those who assassinated Caesar made the idiotic decision to let Caesar's best friend, Mark Anthony, speak at Caesar's funeral. Mark Anthony so stirred up the mob that they burned Rome and ran off those who murdered Caesar. There are a couple of old movie versions of the play, but Marlon Brando and Charlton Heston both play it to the hilt. 
Somehow the audience knows that Mark Anthony is working the crowd. Beneath his outward emotional appearance, Shakespeare makes his Anthony cold and calculating. This was the kind of oratory the Pharisees were engaged in when they really shook up the people. Now, the secular example, of course, is not perfect. Shakespeare just makes stuff up, but it's just so you get the idea. To stir up means incitement to riot. This second of two uses of Anasio, uh, Strong's 383, uh, the first time we met this word was earlier in this session when the religious leaders falsely accused Jesus of inciting riot from Galilee to Jerusalem. Instead, the uh, biblical or oratory that was the incitement to riot was the type of oratory the Pharisees employed. When the Savior spoke, his great oratory lifted men up to prayer, to worship, and to duty. For all the Messiah or Paul's or Peter's great oratory, the word moved could never be used. For peace and edification and salvation resulted from their words, not senseless anger, not crazy rage. These orators of the Pharisees were like 200 Mark Anthonys, screaming at the people and really, really stirring them up. From the context, it appears that they used all the slanderous accusations against Jesus from the night trial, the same accusations they knew they had no evidence for. When uh, Pilate rose from his judgment seat to speak to the people, he had no idea what was about to hit him. Having given the people time to deliberate, Matthew 27, 21 tells what happens when Pilate asks for their verdict. The governor answered them and said to them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release to you? They said, Barabbas. Matthew is very much just the facts about in this tone about the gospel's description of the war between the spiritual kingdoms. In increasing intensity of description, this is what happened according to John and Luke after the Pharisees went to work on the crowd. Here is John eighteen forty. They cried, they all again saying, not this man, Barabbas. The details of how to arrive at the correct text among the uh, textual variations of John nineteen forty are on the document linked to the class. You can see on the screen the Greek word, for all and for again are very similar in spelling. The external evidence to omit again is significant. The older texts that read again omit the word all, and many of the texts that omit the word all include the, include the word again. Finally, there are some peacemaker type Greek texts, like the one the King James Version accessed, uh, that present both words. However, God's word won't fit if you leave again in the text. For the rest of John 18.40 proclaims this verse to be the crowd's first response to Pilate. Perhaps the most intense description of what happened during Pilate's first appeal to the people is given in Luke 23.18. And they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man, and release unto us Barabbas. In Luke, the phrase, they all cried out at once, shows the intense unanimity among the crowd. The Pharisees had really worked them up. John 18.40 is trying to express this unanimity. This is another reason why the analysis of the ancient texts of John 18.40 should keep the word all. These verses testify that the crowd, as one, rejected Jesus of Nazareth and ended Pilate's third attempt to release the Savior. Pilate must have been shaken. He never expected the people to turn on Jesus. From here on out, Pilate's intense, intensified attempts to release Jesus become more and more desperate. Pilate's fourth attempt to release Jesus and his second attempt to uh, appeal to the people is recorded in Luke 23.20. 20. Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus, spake again to them. First time, no use of again. Second time, again. Now that we're on the second appeal to the people, the word again belongs in Luke 23.20. Mark 15, 12a also employs the word again. However, Matthew 27, 22a does not. Instead, to rightly divide the fullness of the words of this second appeal, we must rely on comparing the words of Pilate's second appeal to the people. Luke does not tell us what Pilate said, but Mark 15, 12 does. Here's Mark 15, 12. What will ye then that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? Then Matthew 27, 22 adds, What shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? The words, What shall I do then? Echo marks and shows this is Pilate's second appeal. 
All three Gospels also record in increasing intensity the words the mob cried out to reject Jesus at a second time and to end Pilate's fourth attempt to release Jesus. Matthew 27, 22 says, They all, then all say unto him, Let him be crucified. Mark 15, 13 says, And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Luke 23, 21 says, But they cried out saying, Crucify him, crucify him. I do not credit Pilate with having a great deal of belief in the Messiah. Pilate is still largely motivated to have the man who executed Jesus of Nazareth not become affixed to his resume. His wife's prophecy had nudged him towards waking up, but he wasn't there yet. However, he soon would be. From far away in the 21st century, it looks like it would have been a simple matter to just give an executive order and release Jesus. But it was the Passover. The Pharisees were stirring up the mob, and the mob wanted to kill the Savior. If Pilate releases Jesus, he could well have a, started a massive citywide insurrection, the insurrection he'd feared since the morning light. In Luke 23, 15, Pilate said he would scourge Jesus and then release him. He did not. Instead, after a trial before a lynch mob, Pilate says the exact same thing in Luke 23, 22. And he, Pilate, said unto them a third time, Why, what evil has he done? I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. This is Pilate's third appeal to the people and his fifth attempt or rather, fifth claim that he would release Jesus. This is the third appeal. This third appeal is also recorded in Mark 15, 14a, where it says, And Pilate said unto them, Why, what evil has he done? And in Matthew 27, 23, where it is written, And the governor said, Why, what evil has he done? Ending Pilate's third and last appeal to the people, the people and the priest responded as follows. Here in Mark 14, 1514 b it is recorded and they cried out the more exceedingly crucify him and in matthew 27 23 it says but they cried out even more saying crucify him same words but they got louder they were intensified this is how the gospels back each other up with the specific minute detail and in luke 23 23 through 25 it is written that and they were instant with loud voices, requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. And he released unto them that for sedition and murder was cast into prison, whom they had desired. But he delivered Jesus to their will. Now, he delivering Jesus to their will. There's events that occur between releasing Barabbas and finally when he turns Jesus over to be crucified. Those are given largely in John. Thus ended Jesus' seventh trial, the trial before the lynch mob. Of these events, Peter in Acts 3, 12-14 spoke boldly after lifting up the man laying in the temple daily. And when Peter saw it, he answered to the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we made this man to walk? The God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up, and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. Pilate was determined to let Jesus go. But, he, but ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted to you. Pilate was not finishing, finished trying to release Jesus, but in his last pathetic attempt to release the Savior of the world, Pilate all but gets on his knees and begs the lynch mob's permission to release Jesus. After scourging Jesus, and in violation of Roman law, wrapping him in imperial pur purple, and after beating a crown of thorns into the Messiah's skull, John 19.4 says, Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know I find no fault in him. This is twisted logic. But Pilate thinks that if he scourges Jesus, it would appease the bloodlust of the lynch mob, and that the great pain and agony uh, would have caused anyone to confess to any crimes they had done. John 19.5 continues, Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said unto them, Behold the man. This could never have worked. It never had any chance. As John 19.6 records, When the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, Jesus, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said unto them, 
Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The chief priests weren't going anywhere until Pilate committed Jesus to be crucified. They answer in 19.7. The uh, Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now Pilate, uh, now Pilate may believe. This might have been the moment that turned him around, because look how he reacts. He reacts with great intensity. John says in 19.8-9, through 9, When Pilate therefore heard that saying, that he made himself the Son of God, he was the more afraid. And he went again to the judgment hall and said unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. So he left the mob screaming on the street. He goes back into the judgment hall and privately talks to Jesus. He wants to know. He wants to know. He thinks he understands. And now he's really scared. This is one uh, that, oh, that is above my pay grade. Judas believed, but he didn't make it to Pentecost where he could wash away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Did Pilate make it to Pentecost? Yes. Did he repent? Bible doesn't say. An Ethiopian Orthodox church names Pilate as a martyr. A Coptic church has a feast day named for Pilate. All history actually knows about Pilate's life after AD 28 is that according to Josephus, Pilate around 37 AD, not quite a decade later, was removed from office because he violently suppressed an armed Samaritan movement at Mount Gerizim. He was sent back to Rome by the legate of Syria to answer for this incident before Tiberius, but the emperor died before Pilate arrived in Rome. History doesn't paint a picture of a man who's broken from his old man nature. He's still out there using incredible violence and being probably the worst tribune in recorded history. But again, it's all totally above my pay grade. He does, in fact, uh, get to go on with his life and to live in peace. The Emperor Tiberius passes away before Pilate could be held accountable for his crimes. Was he forgiven? I don't know. Only John's Gospel records Pilate's final two attempts to release Jesus. These are recorded in uh, 1912 through 15. And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. Being Caesar's friend was actually a Roman title that carried some clout. It was being the friend of Caesar was a title carried by Herod Agrippa I and II and by close advisors to the emperor. This was a serious threat to Pilate. His chief priests had Pilate just where they wanted him. Interestingly, John 19.12 says the Judeans cried out, Why were the people still there in Pilate's Praetorium? Barabbas had been released, so why were they still there? They had been stirred up not only to demand Barabbas be released, but also, according to Matthew 27, 20 above, to destroy Jesus. The mob Pilate had feared was upon him. This was Pilate's sixth threat to release Jesus. John 19, 13 through 14 says, When Pilate therefore heard that saying, Thou art not a friend of Caesar, uh, he brought forth Jesus and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. Pilate played his last card. He had Jesus beaten so badly that men and women would turn their faces from him. Previously, Pilate had said, Behold the man. Now he demands the lynch mob, Behold their king. This time, Pilate may not be mocking the Savior. He may instead be begging the mob to see what they were doing. The same confrontational attitude arises when Pilate Make, uh, made the sign for the cross that said, the king of the Jews. Despite the anger of the Pharisees, they said, don't say that. You have to say, he said he was the king of the Jews. But Pilate says, no, I wrote what I have written. But the Jude once he finally stood up to the Pharisees. Anyway, the Judeans did not listen, but they cried out, away with him, away with him, and crucify him. Pilate said unto them, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. For some there that day on the plaza at the Praetorium, this would prove so. Because they refused to believe, they would never have the reign of Jesus Christ in paradise. However, according to Peter's de uh, declarations in Acts 2 and 3, some thousands would believe and be saved. God's love for uh, mankind is so huge, it just never ceases to amaze. In all then, we counted six trials by Jesus Christ, 
three before the religious leaders, one before Annas, two before Caiaphas, and three delivered guilty verdicts. Then we counted three more before secular government, two by Pilate, one by Herod. All three verdicts were not guilty. Then we counted a seventh trial, a trial before a lynch mob. This entailed three distinct appeals by Pilate to the Judeans, all of which were unsuccessful. Then after Barabbas was released, Pilate had Jesus tortured and brought forth again as Pilate for the sixth time threatened to release Jesus. The Gospel of John notes two more appeals to the lynch mob after Pilate learned of Jesus being called the Son of God. The mob refused these attempts also. Eight times then Pilate threatened or sought to release Jesus, the Son of God. All were rejected, but somehow thousands of Judeans would believe God's word, many of whom had, who had been there at Pilate's Bema on the pavement. So four Gospels, written at different times by different men in vastly different places, all support one another over a matter as complex as seven trials, the seventh trial with three appeals, and over Pilate's eight distinct threats to release Jesus. All four Gospels, even down to the words the crowds yelled at Pilate and the words Pilate used to appeal to them, all agree. No testimony of man could agree in any such manner as this. The truth of God's word is just settled in the heavens. God's word is perfect. God's will is perfect. And God's son is perfect. Another example of the perfection in God's word, once it is rightly divided, is Jesus Christ's mighty cry of triumph. As each member of the body of Christ rightly divides the word of God, the division in the church vanishes away. Tradition holds that only moments before our Lord and Savior gave up his life for you and for me, he cried out in a loud voice that he had been, or felt, that he had been forsaken. Tradition seems to teach that moments before he completed his life's work, our Savior wondered what he was doing on the cross anyhow. We are told that his loudest and most powerful words from the cross were, and I can hardly repeat this without a shiver, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Instead, we know from many scriptures that Jesus Christ was absolutely not forsaken. For instance, John 16.32 says, Behold, the hour comes, and now is come, that ye, the apostles, shall be scattered, every man to his own, and ye shall leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Then again, in John 10.20, I and my Father are one. How are you going to separate one? Again, in 2 Corinthians 5.19, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. It would be impossible for Jesus to have cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Here's another awesome scripture just around the corner from Matthew 27, where supposedly our Lord declared boldly that God had forsaken him. In Matthew 26, 26.53, at the end of Matthew 26, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray unto my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? That's 72,000 angels. This truth about 72,000 angels at the Lord's command is given virtually in the immediate context of Eli, Eli, Lamna, Sabathani, uh, or my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Here's how far the scope of the truth of Jesus Christ's relationship to his heavenly Father goes. It goes even to those prophecies that foretell his coming. In Psalms 20, 20, in 22, Psalm 22, 24, it reads, For he hath not despised, nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. The afflicted one in Psalm 22, the afflicted, is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You can tell by the rest of the psalm. There are many more like this throughout the Old Testament. We are delivered because the Father was ever with his Son. The Lord Jesus Christ knew exactly what he was getting into when he decided to give his life for us in the Garden of Gethsemane. There was no reality check. There was no crisis of confidence when he was hanging on the cross. He knew all the prophecies. And when he was hanging on the cross at that moment, he knew he had won. It was literally the ninth hour. E.W. Bullinger, bless his heart, believed that the Lord Jesus Christ recited the entire 22nd Psalm from the cross and in the process converted one of those who crucified him. There wasn't time. After he cries with a loud voice, he fulfilled one last prophecy, taking a drink of hyssop. Then he took a deep breath and gave out another loud cry. It is finished! Which ends Psalm 22. 
Then the Lord bowed his head and gave up the ghost. When Jesus Christ made his cry of triumph, he could see the tape at the spiritual finish line, and his adversary was nowhere in sight. He knew he had won. He knew he had accomplished this great victory for you and for me. And you know what? He had enough left over to roar a great victory cry. He cried in a mega voice. Mega is from the Greek. A mega voice, like a sonic boom. My God, my God, for this purpose I was reserved. You don't think the enemy heard that cry and knew he was finished? That's why the enemy hates the truth of this verse. He's still reeling from the roar of the Lion of Judah. He's still trembling from the power of that blast. Who could possibly have spent so many hours on the cross and yet have the strength to give forth such a mighty shout? And who, having so much strength, could have died so soon afterwards? Only a son of the God who raises the dead could have this strength of Samson. And only the son of God with his divine origin had the authority to freely lay down his life and then pick it up. And the time was fulfilled. Yet there is Matthew twenty-seven forty-six, as found in our King James Version, just contradicting all the rest of the scripture. And about the ninth hour, Jesus Christ, in a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lamna sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So what's the problem? Is the problem with the revealed word and will of God? It can't be. We just saw how perfect it was in giving forth the exact details of Pilate's eight attempts to release the Savior, then where is the problem? There are words in that 46th verse that are Aramaic words. Jesus spoke Aramaic. Aramaic was the language, the lingua franca of the entire East. That's what Jesus spoke from the cross. While there are many Aramaic words preserved in the New Testament, there are not nearly as many that are followed by an explanation or a definition. On that link document I gave you, I've given you nine. For numbers one, four, and eight is conveying historical accuracy by giving place names in Aramaic and explaining them in Greek. And yet it is also conveying important meaning of those words to readers who don't know Aramaic. Interestingly, we are told twice the location of the crucifixion, numbers two and four, and once the language by way of which this place is named. All of these are obvious reasons for the translations to lead one to believe that the translations are part of the God-inspired scriptures. They were not added by translators sometime later. Now, was there a divine reason for Matthew 27, 46, Mark 15, 34, to be given in Aramaic and then Hebrew and to be interpreted in Greek? Absolutely, for both those verses are followed with a similar footnote. Matthew 27, 46 is followed by Matthew 27, 47's declaration that some of them that stood there when they heard that this man calleth for Elias. In other words, they heard Jesus Christ cry out the cry of triumph, but they didn't understand the words. And similarly, in Mark 15, 54 is followed with this note in Mark 15, 35. And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, behold, he calls Elias. He was calling for God, not Elias. They completely missed the entire thing. Uh, certainly, there may have been additional divine rationale for giving these statements in two languages, but it's plain that the misunderstanding concerning Jesus Christ's cry of triumph began before Pentecost, before the church was even born. These interpretations of the things Jesus said were not just left in the text by careless translators. They were words given by divine revelation. However, the rationale behind examples 2, 3, 5, 6, and 7 are a bit more mysterious. Perhaps the languages uh, the, of the believers overflowed into each other without genuine clarity. For instance, in English, the words taco and enchilada have become part of our language without any real understanding of their roots and origins. Perhaps this happened in the early centuries of the church so that by laying out the fundamental origins of Rabboni and Messiah, great light was shed on the church. Perhaps the use of Talitha Kumi shows the great love of Jesus Christ more perfectly. He called her to life in her own native dialect and language, so likewise he shall each of us. Still, these are speculative notions. Nevertheless, we know that from Numbers 1, 4, and 8 that these Greek explanations are of godly design. The second thing these nine citations show is that the Greek explanation of Hebrew or Aramaic is perfect for all these paraphrases. Why then should we expect any less of the Greek manuscripts for Matthew 27:46 and for Mark 15:34? In fact, we should not. 
If we take a good look at these Greek words, the Aramaic becomes as clear as a bell. Furthermore, the problem has never been with the Greek manuscripts. The problem has not even been with the English translation. The problem is older than English. The problem is man's interpretation of the Greek written word. Because the word of God is perfect and speaks for itself, God's word will tell us what the individual words in the verse mean. For instance, both Matthew 27, 46 and in Mark 15, 34, the word translated forsaken is the Greek word ek kata lepo. It is only used 10 times in the New Testament. Three times it is translated, including its first use, as have reserved. Seven times it is translated forsaken. The, uh, all 10 times you can find easily enough in Strong's. In Romans 9, 29 is, however, the key verse in the study of Ek Kadalepo. Here's the verse. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of the Sabbath had left the Ek Kadalepo, left uh, us a seed, we had been as Sodom and like unto Gomorrah. I've set some of the linguistic study of the Aramaic and Greek roots on the class handout link below the audio file. Preserved or reserved is the only possible translation. Forsaken in Romans 9.29 is off the table. When ek katalepo then is in Matthew and Mark, what does it mean? If this word can mean two different things, which does it mean in Matthew and Mark? And how do we know? Just as in Romans 9.29, the immediate context and scope tell us which way this word should be handled in English, so also should the scope inform the translation of ek katalepo in both Matthew 27 and in Mark 15.34. Based on the scope, how do you believe it should be translated? I believe it should be translated reserved. Interestingly, while the Aramaic word in Romans 9.29 is not sabachthani, a form of sabachthani does show up in Romans 11.4. Here is Romans 11.4. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved. Uh, that's Kadalepo, Strong's 2641. And then it's Shabbatani, Aramaic uh, 3096. Just like Strong's has numbers for the Greek words, Jennings has a lexicon that features all the Aramaic words. So his number is 3096A, uh, which is a form of Shabak or Sabbatani. To myself, uh, 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. The Greek word in 11.4 is not reserved, reserved out. It's not reserved out. It's not ek katalepo, but it's simply reserved, katalepo. However, the Aramaic, Aramaic word is not 1357e, but this time it is from the Aramaic Shabak, 3096. It is sabachthani. Now, Jennings' lexicon to the Syriac New Testament supplies many examples of sabachthani, meaning to forsake or abandon. As with ek katalepo, this single use in Romans 11.4 shows that like English has the word left, so also Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic all have words with a similar double edge. That is, they may all mean to have reserved, or they may all mean to depart from. The double-edged Greek word ek katalepo, then, is the perfect translation for the double-edged Aramaic word shabachthani. Both the Greek and the Hebrew require the context to determine the meaning of, my God, my God, I was reserved. Again, because the Greek text was God-breathed, the Greek did not let us down. The word choice is perfect for rendering the sense of the Aramaic shabachthani. By the way, there's plenty of evidence to show shabachthani is Aramaic for to be reserved, or to be spared. Strong's gave Sabachthani the word number 4518 and suggested it was from an Aramaic root word to which he gave Hebrew word number 7662. If you look up 7662 in the Old Testament part of Strong's, there you will find five uses in Aramaic uh, of Sabachthani to mean either to abandon or to forsake. Once it refers to God's kingdom remaining and the last three times in Daniel, it refers to the trunk of the root uh, that, uh, of David that also remains. Uh, the reason these wonderful truths then of Jesus Christ's triumph were lost all those years ago 
was not because of the trouble with the Aramaic word Sabachthani, but because no one could interpret the littlest word in biblical Aramaic. They could not interpret Lama. Hence, they could not f- find support for rendering Jesus Christ's cry of triumph as an exclamatory statement. Instead, everyone decided to believe that the evidence from their words themselves must be understood to fly in the face of the scope of the scriptures and that Jesus Christ's cry of triumph was but a loud question. Perhaps some thought uh, this was a rhetorical question with an exclamatory emphasis, such as when Jesus Christ exclaimed to Peter, O ye of little faith, wherefore did you doubt? However, it's the Greek manuscripts that always held the key. When the Greek is properly punctuated, the questions concerning the Aramaic solve themselves. Please scroll down to page 4 of the class handout to see the jots and tittles. In the Greek, the questions of translation come down to inati in Matthew 27.46 and ice in Mark 15.34. The Byzantine text form is a uh, critical Greek text devoted to preserving the Western tradition of the Greek manuscripts. It differs from Nestle Allen, the 27, another critical Greek text, which means they went through all the library of the manuscripts and they saw the textual variations and they picked amongst them what they felt was the rightly divided word of God and then they punctuated it and everything else. Those are the critical manuscripts. Notice that only the consonants agree between the two Greek manuscripts. Only the uh, accents over the first I and the separation of the words differ. This is also important because the ancient uncials did not place accent marks in the text. Below is the Nestle Island text of 20, Matthew 27, 46, and the text of Codus Synacticus, which is not a critical Greek text in the sense that we understand it today. It's a raw manuscript uh, that passes on a certain form of the original God-breathed word. It's the best way to say it. And it's from the 4th century AD. Notice the markings that make it different. Instead of having uh, punctuation marks, they have lines above the abbreviation for my God that do not occur in Nestle Island. That's because this is an abbreviation for what the uh, ancients called a divine name. Uh, Now, today we don't do that in the critical Greek text. They spell it out in full. Curiously, Synacticus shows four letters for the Aramaic spelling of my God, while Nestle Island has three letters needed in Hebrew for my God. Uh, This is a textual variation. Most importantly, though, in Synacticus, I-N-A-T-I appears without accents of any kind. This is important because when T-I includes the accent mark going from left to right, it is always an interrogative. It's always forming a question. In Strong's number 5101, T-I-S, and it means who, which, or what. However, when the accent is absent or moving from left to right, this is a subset of strong number 5100, tis. It is an indefinite pronoun that means a certain one. The accent supplied by men well after the ancient uncials were uh, penned may or may not be accurate because that's the work of man. And it makes all the difference how they put those uh, punctuation marks in there. It makes all the difference between brilliant truth and tragic error, between a question or a statement, between the perfect, for this certain one was I reserved, and the errant, for what was I reserved. So you're in the driver's seat. There is an ancient unseal without any accents above the T, the I, and the S. What would you do? I know what I'll do. That accent mark is going to be moving from right to left. Why? Because that's my theology? No. It's because that's what fits with the many, many clear verses throughout the entire Bible. Hence, the perfect Greek of Mark, uh, ice T, reads, if you don't allow a later hand to confuse all the accents, unto this certain one. So it would be, my God, my God, unto this was I reserved. The Greek words hina or ina are used in Matthew 27, 46 in place of ice as found in Mark 15, 34, but the essence of the two, both verses are the same. To get the real feel of this cry of triumph, an overly lavish use of capital letters and periods may be necessary. So it goes, my God, my God, unto this was 
I reserved. That's what the Greek says, and that's a cry of triumph, a declaration of victory, an indefatigable shout of glory. This is what our Lord Jesus Christ proclaimed loudly from the cross. For he could see the joy that was set before him. He was utterly unmoved by all the enemy had hit him with. He knew, he knew he had won. He had won for us the redemption prophesied throughout the ages. Because the Hebrew of the Old Testament and the Greek of the New Testament are, when studied critically, God breathed, we can trace all the meanings of the words they use by way of the Bible itself. However, the Aramaic words in the canon of the Bible are far fewer. Nevertheless, one can understand the potential for Lama to introduce a, de a declarative or exclamatory statement by studying the ancient Targums. These are ancient translations, uh, sometimes interpretations of the Old Testament. When we plug Lama into an Aramaic Old Testament, the Targums, there are several instances of Lama introducing a declarative statement. I've posted those verses. Uh, translations run from, for what purpose, or for this purpose, the references are on the class handout. While we are better off working with words the scripture gives us, it is remarkable how perfectly the Greek translates the Aramaic. Even the Targums are not the optimal source for explaining the meaning of Eli, Eli, Lamna, Sabathani. No, but the revelation in the Greek manuscripts in themselves are the authority. After all, that is why God gave inspired explanations of the Aramaic in the first place. Some believe that Jesus was quoting Psalm 22. I believe he was fulfilling it. I don't know the answer to the meaning of Psalm 22.1, but if you look at the chart on the handout, it adds to the intrigue. The Targums use, Zabek Thani is used in Psalm 22.1 for the word translated in, in the Hebrew as forsaken. I don't know the answer. The Greek then clarifies the Aramaic, and so the Bible itself tells us that Jesus Christ did not say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Indeed, he gave a battle cry of triumph and boldly declared in the final moments before his death, My God, my God, for this certain one, this destiny, I have been reserved. He, un he endured more than any mortal man, and he remained unbowed, unmoved, undefeated, on the cross to the last. When the Lord made his great cry of triumph, he knew there was nothing left but the joy and glory of his resurrection. God bless you then. God's word is the best, uh, and you are indeed sons of God, even as that word declares.